Well, hello. My name is Rick Fuentes. Um, I've been with uh, Retail Pro around 20 years or now. So I know a few of you, for those of you who don't. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about uh, social channel opportunities for retailers. And retail has changed due to the impact that the internet, mobile phones, and social media have brought to the shopping experience, retail has changed. Retail has gone viral. It's a whole new ball game. It's a new way of doing things. It's a new way of thinking. And you need to understand this change, and you need to embrace it. There's no doubt that social media is booming. And with social media has brought the power of the web to the individual. At the same time, the shift in power wreaks havoc on businesses as they now try to market their product. They're not used to relinquishing that control. However, businesses are starting to realize that with change comes great opportunities. So what does this mean for your business? As a political comedian says, time for new rules. You have to adapt to these new rules. You have to engage with your customers on a totally different level. You have to talk to them where they're at, whether they're on Facebook, whether they're on Twitter, whether they're on Instagram. And you need to provide them tools to be able to inter integrate and act with your products or services. You have to provide a more, a, instead of a single, line of communication, more conversation, and more education. You want to make them smarter. You want to provide them that information. So what I'd like to do today is provide you some different opportunities which are avail available for you, a little bit of history, some examples of how other retailers have embraced this and taken advantage of it, so you can decide which would work best for you. In essence, you want to get a person to stop, read, think, and behave differently in a profitable ac action for you. So why should we pay attention to social media? I mean, one out of five people in the world now have a smartphone. I still remember having to use a payphone. That tells you my age. Um, four to five mobile consumers use their smartphone to shop. And 40% of them use them to actually consult three or more channels before making a purchase. We are connected to our devices. It's a total new world now. And we've got our iPads. We have our smartphones. And we're connected. We're using our smart device to access information on the smartphone itself. We're using it to access the internet. We're using it to check emails. We're using it to download apps, play games, and make purchases. We are now connected. And for the first time, the landscape in which brands and businesses operate has changed forever. We've seen earlier this year that mobile internet usage surpassed desktop internet usage. And it's taken time for brands to embrace the potential of the internet. And some of them are still struggling with the digital landscape to satisfy their customers. But the time has come to consider a more mobile friendly aspect to your business. So think about it. We're connected all the time. We wake up in the morning, what do you do? Grab your smartphone, check your emails. On your breakfast, you might be on your tablet, checking the news, checking emails. Right? On your commute to work, for those of you who don't drive, don't drive and be using your smartphone at the same time. You're checking emails, you're checking news. At work, we have a dual combination between the smartphone and between your desktop. From there on a break, you use it for browsing, calling, messaging. Then back at work again, when that combination. And lunch, we do a little bit of everything. Here's where we'll find the highest percentage of, of mobile uh, internet usage. Back at work combination, on the commute home, checking your news, emails, browsing. Then when you get home relaxing on your tablet, you do some purchases. And then when you go to bed, you have most likely will have your smartphone on your night table. Most people have their smartphone. You don't? Good for you. 
uh, have their smartphone. I know he does. <laughs> um, actually have their smartphone at our arm's length. And 75% of Americans admit of taking it to the bathroom. Can anybody say kaplunk? <laughs> All right. So five years ago, these networks didn't exist. There was no Snapchat, no Vines, not even Pinterest, Instagram. I mean, a lot of these things, my daughter brought me into it. Oh, you have to use this. It's coming. It's here. You have to understand that social media is part of retail now. I mean, the Facebook like came out in 2009. So a lot has happened very quickly. So with the sea of social networks that are available and millions of, user using, millions of users actually using these social networks, brands can't just hop on Facebook anymore and say, oh, yeah, I've got a plan. Yeah, I've got them on Facebook. You no longer can do that. You have to make an informed decision in which network you're going to invest your time, your resources, and your finance to achieve the best results. And it's no longer about following the masses. It's about following a targeted audience. And you have, if you want to succeed, you're going to need to have coherent and engaging content with compelling visuals and authentic stories. So what are the trends that we'll be seeing um, for the rest of the year and going into next year? Audiovisual content. Again, these networks, Vines, Pinterest, Instagram, we're able to foresee the importance of video con audiovisual content. So we'll see a rise in pictures. We'll see a rise in graphics. We'll see an, a rise in, in, in microclips. But they will be targeted and sophisticated. That's what's going to dominate. And keep in mind, you're going to have to have a budget. Be prepared to embrace and be prepared to invest in social media. So before I go into the channel opportunities, I just want to talk about one network who's done far more in a short amount of time than Facebook has in a long since it's been around, which is Pinterest. The importance of Pinterest has become undeniable for retailers. More and more data comes out of every day pointing to Pinterest, driving the highest percentage of traffic and sales. They're a dominant player in social media. And they become a gold mine for retailers. With the addition of rich pins, which allows more flexibility, retailers can now add more information to the images that are people are pinning. So for example, they can add real-time pricing, inventory availability, and a buy to link. So therefore, um, if my wife goes to Nordstrom's and she sees a, sees a bag that she likes, and she takes an image to share with her social network. If a week later the price changes, she would receive an email directly from Pinterest notifying her of that pr price change, not from Nordstrom's. This is a total benefit for, for the retailer. At the same time as she shares this with all her friends in her network, there may be people that are not on Nordstrom's email list now reaching them also. And talking about Nordstrom's, they're definitely a leader in social media. Right now, they were awarded the Genius Status Award, according to a new report from L2, which is an intelligence service which benchmarks uh, show social competence. Nordstrom has 4.5 million users on their, on their network. And they feel Pinterest is just one big wish list. And what they've decided to do is allow the Pinterest community to influence over the displays in the store. So now you'll find a little red tag that says Pinterest. And this, these displays will be with that red tag. Besides using this just to, for the displays, they've also used it to add their, their holiday catalog. So Pinterest is one network you might want to check out. So what are the social channel opportunities that are, for, that are out there for you? Well, we have real-time marketing. We have geotargeting or location-based. And we have uh, content retailing. So the first one I'm going to talk about is real-time marketing. I only have one example, but I think it's a perfect example of the power of real-time marketing. 
This isn't a retailer per se. This was a, a, a sporting event. And in sporting events, uh, advertisers need to do more than just run commercials. They have to stay on their toes, and they need to be on social networks. They need to be on Twitter. They need to be on Instagram. They need to be, have that presence. And this brand, no brand, pulled off more fancy footwork than this brand did. Two years ago, in the Super Bowl 47, not the one bef this year, the one before, there was a power outage at the stadium. This brand's social media jumped on the occasion immediately. And a little while later, they sent out a tweet in Twitter with a starkly lit Oreo, power out, no problem. You can still dunk in the dark. They caught everyone by surprise. Real-time marketing isn't new, but we never had a singular amazing example of what real-time um, marketing was capable of and the attention it could garner. They went on to win all kinds of awards. Other advertising agencies went on to try to duplicate the same success for their customers. It's a true example of, how, of a magical moment, how everything falls into place at the same time. Geotargeting or location-based. Well, geotargeting is 75% of smartphone users have some sort of location-based service. It tells you where nearby businesses are. It gives you directions. You have reviews. You can call the business, use the business as a mobile app. Um, so the objective of geotargeting is encourage all these activities, which I just mentioned, but get the people back into the brick and mortar store. They're coming by, get a way to get those bodies back in, drive that foot traffic, give them discounts and gain loyalty. So if you've ever been in a shopping area, shopping mall, and you have the, some sort of service, and you receive a coupon on your smartphone, you are most likely geotargeted. Macy's, Best Buy, Walmart have all incorporated an e-coupon product, which allows consumers, as they go by the store, to receive merchant, uh, merchandise offers, uh, store offers, e-coupons, uh, e-commerce links, price comparisons. Get them back into the store. And they're all individually tailored to their buying habits. So one example of a retailer using a geotargeting and location-based uh, location uh, marketing is uh, Alex and Annie. They've incorporated the iBeacon solution, which is actually available uh, on the Apple iOS 7, and it can be downloaded for, for Android. And the iBeacon solution is a location sensing technology. So not only does it pick up if you're near the store, but it can actually determine where you are in the store. So if you're in the men's department, the women's department, the children's department, they can actually then target based on your location inside the store to provide you offers and information. When Alex and Annie piloted the solution, they used a marketing firm called Swirl, which already had a user base. Instead of sending flash sales or flash discounts and promotions, they used this period to educate the Swirl users that were already there, providing information about their brand, providing information about their jewelry. It was a total success for them. 30% of the traffic actually went to the store, and the percentage of people who actually purchased was in the high teens. Another retailer is Lord Taylor's, uh, Hudson Bay, are also using the iBeacon product. They're a department store. They're not the first to use iBeacon, but they're probably one of the largest to use it. Their first stores, their first 10 stores, they use this to send out specific campaigns, coupons, and they wanted to determine which was best accepted amongst their customers. So geotargeting, in essence, if a business invests in to increase their location aware audience base, they're reporting better conversions, they're reporting um, their business is easier to find, they're skillfully combining 
marketing and, and targeting marketing together, and it provides a, the perfect example of the convergence of the online and the physical store experience. So it's something you want to check out. Content retailing. It's all about the content. So content retailing says it's a marketing technique, creating and distributing valuable and relevant content uh, and consistent content to attract and acquire a clearly defined audience with the objective of, of driving profitable customer action. It's the definition. Basically, get somebody to stop, read, think, and behave differently in a, in a profitable manner for you. So it's providing them valuable and relevant content. Take those two words out. You have the same information that you receive every day that's not relevant to you, and you just dismiss it. Spam. I'm not interested. I, this is, has nothing to do with me. So you want to make sure you provide valuable and relevant content. So content retailing is the art of communicating without selling. Deliver information that makes your customers more intelligent. You want to provide consistent and valuable information so you gain their loyalty. So how do we do this? You want to create interest of your product through education, through entertainment, through informative material. Whether it's news, whether it's photos, whether it's videos, whether it's case studies. If you have good content, you will make someone stop, read, think, and behave differently in a profitable manner for you. And this isn't new. This isn't a new concept. Back in 1895, when Schaff was born, um, the John Deere Company created a, a, a magazine called The Furrow. In essence, it was to provide farmers guidance on how to be more profitable. The Michelin Guide in the 1900s provided a guide for drivers to find nearby restaurants and recommendations and how to change a tire. So the concept isn't new. Here's one example of a retailer, uh, a bohemian lifestyle, free, appear, free people apparel, created a campaign which was product with a product specific hashtag, hashtag. When they would ship the product, they would provide this hashtag to be able to share with other people and they encouraged the customer to upload images of themselves wearing the free people apparel. And it just snowballed. It boomed. They received the product, wow, and they saw themselves on the website. And they would share it with somebody else. And somebody else would buy it. It had this chain effect, and it was all about making the people the star. Keep.com targets, it's a fashion targeting women's in 20s and 30s. They felt that Instagram was the place to be for the fashion world, based on what they were reading off of bloggers and how they would communicate during live fashion events with Instagram. So they created a list of 100 most fashionable. And they looked for musicians, actresses, actors, comedians, and they went through this list identifying makeup, shirt, shoes, hats, anything from the fashion world on these celebrities. And they provided a link to the, for the product that was actually in the image. So if I wanted to buy Jimmy Fallon's tie, I could just click on that image and I would be able to get a link to where I could buy that exact same tie. This is a good example of how the fashion world was able to use social media as a point of sale. Brewberries. This was a a campaign, one of their earlier campaigns, if not their first, um, back in 2009, I believe, The Art of the Trench. They were targeting trench coat aficionados, and they wanted to use their Facebook page to encourage social media. So what they did is they had people upload images of themselves with trench coats. And again, using the fashion world bloggers, they, re they accessed and, and used people to vote and comment on the look. This campaign alone brought Brewberry's Facebook page up to a million followers. 
Today they have over 16 million followers on Facebook. The Guitar Center. This one's kind of close to home to me. I'm a wannabe musician. I'm here, so I'm doing my day job, so that tells you how good I play. Um, actually, on the far left, right, that's me on the keyboards. The Guitar Center talks to a very specific audience in a very specific way through the music. And what they do is they provide fun and an innovative uh, information and forums for all musicians. And they provide um, promotions, which are everything is all linked directly with the Guitar Center's website. So the musicians can go check out the videos, interact. Oh, I want to do this promotion, a singing contest. Oh, I need a guitar for that. Go straight to the link over their page and they can buy the instrument. Kate and Spade is a perfect example of the perfect social mix. I believe Sandra talked a little bit earlier today on Omnichannel. What they've done is they've incorporated the different networks for different social, for different use cases. So for example, they'll use Facebook for brand awareness. They'll use Twitter to drive engagement. They'll use Instagram to give a peek into their, their headquarters. They'll use YouTube for photos and, and, and video content. They in break that omni-channel process, providing that experience to the customer that wherever they go, the Kate and Spade brand is there. So the four questions you have to ask yourself. Who's your audience? Again, it's no longer about targeting the masses. You have to focus on a targeted audience. And you have to know why you're doing this. There has to be a business decision behind what you are doing. It's just not jumping on, on one of the networks. Whether you want, you need to have a, decide a business decision, which I want to drive more sales. I want to drive more foot traffic. I want a higher conversion rate. With that business objective is how you determine why you're doing this and you compete your, your campaign. What's in it for the reader? Valuable and relevant content. Informative. It has to be relevant to them. If it's not relevant to them, they're just going to dismiss it as spam. What's the replacement factor? What are you doing? Why are you doing this? If what you're doing can be found anywhere else on the, on the internet, then why do it at all? You need to be the go-to resource for your, for your customers to go to your store. So what do you stand, what do you, what your business st stands to gain? You'll get increased brand loyalty. You'll get trusted reviews. You'll get real-time feedback. With all this interaction going on, you'll have group advocates. They'll be ambassadors to your brand, to your product, taking your product where no product has gone before. So think about this. Embrace this. This will provide you success in your businesses. So the choice is yours. Whether you want to use a real-time strategy, whether you want to use a content retailing, or whether you want to use uh, geotargeting, or a combination. Take the time, think about it, invest, embrace. Social media is here, and you need to embrace it and take advantage of it. So one last example that I'm going to leave you today is the Coca-Cola campaign, which is very personalized, as you can see, which has come back again. Just beware of the subliminal messages. Thank you very much.